I'm going to hit the record button for my official intro. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Andrea Decker, and I have the pleasure of working for the Fleet Science Center. And you are joining us, in case you're not quite aware, <laughs> for our Suds and Science program. It's one of our monthly science engagement opportunities for adults. And the name Suds and Science comes from the fact that we normally, were we not in a pandemic, take this program to a bar. So there would most likely be some suds uh, involved <laughs> in the talk. Um, like I said, we host these, this program once a month. It's always the second Monday of each month. And uh, in the non-pandemic times, we switch neighborhoods. So one month we are in, Escon in sorry, Vista, then we are in central San Diego, and then we're in Chula Vista, and then we go around again. But here we are in a virtual world, and that's still better than nothing, is what I say. At least we can engage with each other and we can have some fun uh, with science. We can learn something and engage in some good discussion because that's what Sets and Science is all about. It is not a traditional lecture, so you won't see, be seeing any PowerPoint tonight. And there is a purpose to that. We have our speaker give a verbal introduction into the topic. And then we open this up for discussion and questions and just a good conversation amongst all of us about what we just heard from our speaker, um, which I love about the program because I think it's much more engaging for the audience um, because you can ask and talk about this topic in any way that you would like. So you get out of the event what you would really like to learn from the speaker and um, about the subject. And I just love that. So the way this works is that for the first part, when our wonderful speakers, uh, Dr. Stacey Bridges will talk, I'm gonna record this and that's why I started the recording. But once she's done with her sort of official introduction into her work, then I'll turn off the recording and then I hope all of you will be able to turn on your cameras um, so that we can see each other. It just makes the conversation a little bit easier. You don't have to, it's all voluntary, um, but it just helps with having a conversation and it makes it a little bit more comfortable with speaker because sometimes you have the feeling you're just talking to a black little screen. Um, so with that, I hope that makes sense. We have the chat. So if you have a question in between that you want to ask, you can either unmute you and ask it, or you can raise your hand and I call on you, or you can put it in the chat. Um, and then afterwards, we'll get more questions and conversation going. All right, Stacy, with that, why don't you take it away? Well, thank you, Andrea, and I'm really excited to be here. And I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight, um, especially given the circumstances and the hour. Um, I'm really excited to have the opportunity to talk to you and with us, and I really look forward to the conversation we are about to have. Um, so to begin, just I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I am a teaching professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at the University of California, San Diego. I'm also Vice Chair of Equity, Diversity, Inclusion and Climate for our department. And I hold a third role, which is as the Director of Education and Outreach for a new $18 million National Science Foundation funded research center on material science and engineering. And this is a center that focuses on predictive assembly as well as engineered living materials. And so I figured, so those are sort of title pieces, but I'm gonna do as James Lipton would do um, on our Inside the Actor Studio. And he always says at the beginning, let's start at the beginning. So I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up in a rural part of um, called the Ottawa Valley, which is just about an hour outside of the capital of Canada. And through my K through eight education, I attended a small school. I had one teacher, in fact, um, for all of my disciplinary subjects with the exception of French, um, where I had a French teacher. So I only share that because my true introduction or first introduction to science was really through my rural upbringing and my interaction with nature. Um, and the fact that in my community, it was very much centered around agriculture and farming, forestry and mining. So I learned a lot about where my food came from, both from the garden and you know, from local farmers, including members of my family. And from that, I can wanted to say, I'm gonna fast forward from that early experience and jump over high school and 
get to being at university. And so I'm a first generation college student and it was following my first year of studies in general sciences that I decided to focus my pathway on chemistry. And I really came to see chemistry as a central science and that was really part of the attraction to that, how chemistry was really embedded within many of the other sciences um, in its connection to physics and mathematical underpinnings of chemistry, et cetera. In addition, something that was really seminal for me as an undergraduate student were my early experiences in research, both which took place in industry as well as in academia. And it was those experiences that really changed the course of my future because true wake into the excitement of what I was studying, Stan, that I didn't want to end my studies there. And so this is the time where I decided that I would pursue a doctoral degree and really shift away from thinking about any other professional schooling. So I start graduate school and I quickly focus in on inorganic organometallic chemistry. And I spent my time developing my skills and as, as an experimental chemist. So in the research laboratory and, and also complementing that with um, skills in computational chemistry. So being able to use computers to study the molecules that I was synthesizing. And the focus of my work was really about designing and developing in the lab synthesizing and then characterizing molecules that we referred to as molecular propellers. So these were systems that were designed on mechanical principles that through external stimuli could behave as molecular machinery. So this was, you know, in early periods of time, the advent of the studies in nanoscience. So while I was very, very excited about what I was doing in the research lab, I also very early on was interested in my own development as a graduate student. And one of the things that I recognized quite early was that while I was getting a very rigorous foundation in research skills and practice, I was less so um, getting an education around the soft skills, so less soft skill development. And there was a time that I had an opportunity to actually <clears throat> write about that. And that took me to a level of advancing and representing graduate student interests at the national level in Canada. And at the same time, sort of serendipitously, my experiences in that arena led me and a number of other graduate students, a small number of graduate students in various science disciplines um, to start an outreach program in the sciences. And this began because there was an interested parent who was seeking um, interested graduate students to go out to their children's school to do some outreach activities. And we quickly saw that this was something that we needed to expand. It wasn't about one parent, it was really about you know, a broader community. And again, this links back to the soft skill development. So this is a program that we ended up, I, myself and a colleague in physics, ended up growing the program, linking it to a national program in, science, in Canada that is known as Let's Talk Science, and getting a lot of external funding for this program. And by the time that I handed it over, because <clears throat> I worked on it for a couple of years at the university that I was at, McMaster University in Canada, we had grown it such that we had over 200 students, graduate students in the science and engineering disciplines, as well as in the medical school, who are on a regular basis interfacing with K through 12 teachers in the greater Toronto area, um, working in their classrooms. And I share all this because this is what led me to the United States and actually drew the attention of a programs at Columbia University. So I began officially my professional life at Columbia University in New York City. And it's there that I really started to shift my career interests truly away from the research laboratory in that sense, towards focusing on discipline-based education research and practice. So today, the work that I focus on really is about increasing access to and retention in the sciences, but with a specific focus around chemistry. And 
I focus in three main areas. One is about changing what and how we teach at the undergraduate level. A second is about developing programs that support students both at the undergraduate and graduate level with a particular focus on underrepresented minorities as well as women. Um, and a third is developing professional development for educators, both graduate students who serve as teaching assistants at our universities, as well as faculty. Now, I'm going to be focusing really on the first, which is the classroom, our science classroom, and the what we're teaching and how we're teaching. But before I do, I want to convince you that this is important um, and really highlight why it is that, you know, this is where I spend my time and this is where I truly am passionate about about the work that I do and that I don't see it as work, in fact. So why is this relevant to us as a society and hopefully you as members of our society? So I wanna think about and have us think about our science classrooms, right, at our university. In those classrooms sits our future lawyers, our future doctors and nurses and other medical practitioners, sits our future government leaders, sits so many individuals who are going to go on and take seats and positions in our society. And for some of them, in sitting in that classroom, it may be the first and the only experience that they have in science at the university level. And for others, it serves as a foundation for future studies in chemistry, as well as future studies in science and engineering. So here's what we know. Regardless of their career paths, we know that all these students, each and every one of them, are going to need to use their science knowledge and hopefully will have developed an interest and an engagement in science so that they can engage in our society. They are going to have to use that information. And so for their participation, right, whether it comes to issues of climate change, whether it comes to issues right now, we're dealing with the pandemic of COVID-19, science underlies every aspect of our daily life. And this is the premise of science literacy. Now, for those students who are actually gonna go on and pursue science as a potential career, what we know is that the attrition rates in college science classes are very high, particularly the very introductory level. And what's more, many students are leaving the sciences, but what we do know and what research shows is that students who have been previously excluded from the sciences, and these are students who may identify as Black, Hispanic, Latino, um, students who come from Indigenous communities, these students, though they at this point are actually represented on parity with um, our nation's talent pool. And when we look at, you know, even within a state level that these students leave at a much greater degree. So the attrition is even higher for groups of students that we can call peers, previously excluded um, individuals um, based on ethnicity or race. The key is that when you look at the data, this hasn't changed in 30 years. So here's the key in this is that economic prosperity is really dependent on diversity. Our knowledge-based economy needs a diverse community and that diverse community improves learning and problem solving. It strengthens organizational culture and teamwork. And it enhances research and innovation. And to that end, Science and innovation in science and creativity in science is totally predicated on having a diverse perspective, diversity of thought and diversity of experiences. So this is a social imperative. And we can come at this and say, we need to change the way we teach and how we teach, not just for the sake of it being a social justice issue, but it's a business issue and it's also has to do with educational benefits. So really, if we're going to change the system, 
we want to be able to focus on our first year of studies so that our students who sit in our classrooms and are deciding whether or not they belong in the sciences and can see themselves potentially even pursuing a career in the sciences or even seeing that it holds import to their daily lives. We've got to do something to change it. So at this point, I want to return to my work and begin by telling you a little bit about some of the things that I've done, focusing first on the what we're teaching and then moving towards a little bit of the how we're teaching. So one of the stories I wanna tell you about is general chemistry. And our general chemistry curriculum um, has been fairly static over even 50 years. You know, we have a certain content that we need to teach our students right? And each course builds on the next course and of course then to the next year, etc. And certainly there's been a lot of research in education that is taking a look at different ways that we can reorient our curriculum and we can embed, for example, our cross-cutting concepts um, with core ideas and scientific practices. And a lot of those ideas are emerging out of K through 12 education. But one of the things that I recognized in teaching general chemistry was that many students were lacking context and they were lacking relevance because of that context that was missing. And we were also missing opportunities to actually embed some of the other really important lifelong skills that our students would need. So about a decade ago, through a number of iterations, I introduced a project called Chemistry in a Sustainable Context. And this was an opportunity to help the students link what they had learned through their full year of general chemistry with a topic of interest. And I, it was a play on sustainability because it was embedding concepts of sustainability as well as sort of systems thinking, which is an idea that is really emerging out of the sciences, but also it was about sustaining their interests in science and using chemistry as a conduit for that. And what students had an opportunity to do was to investigate a topic of their interest. And the key was they were guided through the whole approach to conducting research in the literature. And this emerged with work um, in collaboration with our library at UC San Diego and content librarians, as well as librarians with an education specialty who helped me to build instructional videos that could be parsed out. And over a course of an academic term, students would be learning and practicing the skills of searching the literature, making sense of the literature, questioning the papers that they found, making a distinction between primary, secondary, and tertiary literature, and understanding the bias that perhaps they may encounter, thinking about about all of that, who is publishing it, when was it published, what is the expertise of this individual in the field. And at the end, the students also went through the process of learning how to communicate more effectively and adopting or changing, I should say, a role that they had a, a lot of practice in their writing classes, but writing for one particular audience. And so teaching them how do you write a scientific paper that's going to be published in a journal format for an audience that is of your peers. And students have the opportunity to not just write a paper, but also if they wanted to, to produce an instructional video. So this was a really transformative experience and it's something that I've been able to acquire a lot of pre and post data on and tracking students both success and interest in this, but also seeing how students would be able to navigate an experience like this when they had a lot of choice and choice is a really important piece in education, right? In terms of motivation, um, but connecting that to, as they were encouraged to either their major or their potential career goals or simply an interest that they had. And to give you an idea, right? Students might be exploring a new research study that had come out recently in some area of nanoscience. They might have been exploring topics in um, more related to a career that they were hoping to pursue in medicine. And you know, it was just very large. And in fact, the suggested topics that were categorized or choose your own, there were more than 50. 
And I would highlight here that this consistently has taken place in classes, general chemistry classes that are typically of 300 to about 420 students in a given class. So that was an interesting piece, right, to think about this, that you're really working to develop students' information literacy skills, making those connections to the content that they are being exposed to in class, to an, a topical piece, something that is emerging, research that is emerging um, in the peer review journals, and actually then practice communicating that to their peers and putting it together in a publishable format. So that is one example of a curriculum reform that I've been able to introduce in a very large setting at a research university like UC San Diego. Another example, just to give you from the general chemistry context is something that I just did this, this past fall. And now this would be at the, the first course of the series. And um, one of my colleagues who's on board here is the, who is the director of our MERSEC Center, um, Professor Michael Saylor had an opportunity to participate in this. And this is called the Scientist Spotlight. And this is actually yet again, another, um, another type of or exercise or tool that has actually undergone a lot of research and shown to be um, very effective in its impact on helping students develop a science identity as well as maintain interest in the sciences. And the key is that we um, have missed the point often that students in terms of seeing themselves within scientists, we often have focused on presenting students someone that looks just like themselves or has had a path just as they have had. And instead, what research, excuse me, research has shown is that students who are exposed to a diversity of scientists who may have had very, very different pathways than the students themselves don't necessarily have to come from the same cultural ethnic backgrounds as the students, for example, but who through the, the way that the exercise is actually um, incorporated into the curriculum, the students have an opportunity to hear more about who is practicing science and the paths that they have taken. And so I'll just say that this was a wonderful opportunity, even in a Zoom setting, working within that to adapt this kind of exercise to an online environment and to invite scientists into our general chemistry classroom online, which in the fall at UC San Diego was a class of over 600 students who had the opportunity to be exposed to scientists in industry as well as academia. And for many scientists reading their reflections about what it was like to hear the stories of scientists and to actually learn from them and just be exposed to science that was taking place and was current was transformative. And so that was really exciting. Now that is just a few examples of sort of curricular transformations focused on general chemistry. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that a lot of my other efforts are focused in also on the lab component. So our lecture and lab courses at UC San Diego are separate. So over the last few years, I've been working on various renditions of our general chemistry laboratory for specifically for chemistry majors. And part of reinvigorating our curriculum there in the lab has been to really um, embed not just current and modern techniques and and um, modern lab experiences, but to really reinforce the attainment of scientific practices within and to help students really see that what the experience of a lab course is really intended to be. And so that is very exciting because we've been able to introduce um, various innovations in terms of plastics synthesis and analysis to um, biodiesel synthesis, and I'm hoping in the future to connect this up with our new MERSEC Center to introduce new materials as well as computational work. Now I'm watching time, so you can ask me later following this, but there are many other curricular pieces that I am excited to tell you about. Um, one, which I'll just hint at, is 
the use of a high impact practice. And these are practices that are known to really improve access and not access, I shouldn't say that, but retention across all of undergraduate studies, not simply the sciences, but one are our early seminars. And there is a, sem a seminar that I've developed that has to do with really about science and science literacy and engaging students in really experiencing and thinking about how we learn and how in fact we learn in informal contexts like the Fleet Science Center and how that is complemented by, but also quite different by formal context. So that's a really fun, piece of yet again, just trying to really change things up in higher education. But I wanna to get to the last piece here, which is, it's not just about what we're teaching, but it's about how we're teaching. And the two go hand in hand in many ways. But I think one of the things that I would highlight here is that we have recognized over time the importance of what are called inclusive pedagogies. So this is with intention, really considering evidence-based practices such as active learning, such as incorporation of motivation and mindset and teaching students about this in the classroom, such as many other very small interventions, utility value interventions and other things that can help students develop a sense of belonging in the classroom, but that can also foster community. So that is another big part of my work. And I think it's a really exciting area for all of us in education, but it also has implications and spreads out to us thinking about it in a broader context of the students and the individuals that we mentor, for example, um, in research settings. So before I end though, and very much connected to this idea of inclusive classrooms and diversity in science, and the importance of that and what we can do to change things in the undergraduate classroom, particularly, particularly, excuse me, at the first year level. <clears throat> I do want to tell you about some research that is ongoing um, between myself and a colleague in the Division of Biological Sciences at UC San Diego by the name of Stanley Lowe, as well as <clears throat> um, graduate students who are part of the math and science education doctoral program, which is joint between UC San Diego and San Diego State University. And so we got interested in this project a couple of years ago, and we asked the question around diversity and connected to inclusive classroom spaces. How do instructors actually conceive of diversity in a classroom setting? And of course, I should highlight, right, diversity has a varied meaning and meaning that is definitely changing over time. But what we were able to do is interview 30 faculty and or postdocs from minority serving institutions. And from those interviews, we took and coded the interviews and used a theoretical lens because this now merges right into education research, social science techniques, social science education or research techniques, a theoretical framework um, called phenomenography. Now that is less important, but I wanna tell you about the outcome of this study. And we're writing the paper up now and we have done a lot of, um, this turns me to the topic of doing faculty development around what we have found. And the key was, as we were coding, faculties discussing <clears throat> their concepts of diversity, teaching and learning in the context of higher education, we noticed that faculty, there are five aspects related to diversity that faculty focus on. So I wanna just, I'm gonna grab my notes here so that I am very clear when I am highlighting these. So I can't show you a PowerPoint, but I can mention these. And this, so this is interesting. So of course, faculty, focus on student characteristics. And these are how the instructors actually interpret the diverse characteristics of students. Okay, now what are those? I won't really highlight here, but we also notice merging out of this that faculty also have a particular mindset. And this is how they in, in fact view student intelligence. Last or I, the next one, learning environment. So this is how an instructor would perceive the impact of student diversity in the classroom. 
A fourth aspect were about pedagogical actions. So this is how an instructor would actually understand their role in teaching diverse students. And the last had to do with the concept of legitimized membership. And this is how instructors position their students within higher education. So one of the key aspects of this approach and research approach in education is to develop what is called an outcome space. So it helps us visualize through these aspects, the conceptions that the instructors would have. And I just want to now, just as we end off, compare two of the conceptions on the extremes. So we had three conceptions of diversity that we noticed amongst instructors in higher education. The one conception we called the essentialist. And the essentialist really has a fixed view and it's divorced of the individual. And these instructors, in terms of student characteristics around diversity, see them as static. They see the student intelligence is fixed. It's an innate quality that actually cannot be changed. In terms of learning environment, these instructors actually see diversity, student diversity, as being irrelevant to the classroom experience or an impediment. In terms of pedagogical actions, these instructors actually employ equal treatment of their students. So they really see it as the classroom as a space of meritocracy. And lastly, when it comes to positioning students in higher education, students are considered outsiders. They have the responsibility of navigating higher education on their own. Now let's contrast that with the extensionists. So these are names that we have generated. And the extensionist as an instructor really views students or focuses on student diversity as who they can become. So students' characteristics are really couched in terms of the students' lived experiences when it comes to a focus on diversity. They really see in terms of student intelligence uh, that they have a growth mindset about their students. So they see that some intelligence is something that can obviously develop right over time and and all related to that. In terms of the learning environment, there's a real reciprocity where all parties can give and receive new insights in the learning environment. From a pedagogical point of view, there is intentional implementation really around practices that will engage students and actually build upon the rich diversity that exists in the classroom because of the student experiences. And lastly, instructors view students as having a rightful presence in higher education and as being partners in the experience and helping and seeing that there is again this reciprocity between the students and all the other members of our higher education community. So I think a really valuable lesson from this study that has emerged is that even though we may consider aspects of student diversity in the classroom, it doesn't necessarily mean that we are promoting an inclusive classroom space. So with that, I want to end <clears throat> by saying here that um, obviously the concept of diversity is very complex and it's changing with time but it really is at the very core of our society and science itself. So I hope I've convinced you of the fact that <clears throat> how important it is for us to think about being champions of change in the classroom and science classrooms in particular, so that our students can be inspired by and interested in science, regardless of the paths that they intend to take. So thank you. And I look forward to discussing more about this with you. Thank you so much, Stacey. And for everybody uh, watching this video online after the event, um, sorry you'll miss out on the fabulous discussion that I'm sure will um, ensue now, but I hope that also uh, makes you curious about attending this event uh, in a next time in person for the next Sets and Science. So with that, I'm gonna say goodbye to our online audience. I'm gonna stop the recording. Thank you so much and stop.